to go first with anything you wanted to share, Neville, and then we can discuss more widely around it. I've got a couple of slides with a couple of examples on if we need them. Um, but I'll, I'll try and share just just uh, three or four slides that I've thrown yeah. together. Uh, so I'll, I'll briefly introduce myself to, to people on the call. So my name is uh, Neville Young. I work in uh, an HSN. Uh, you, you might have heard them being discussed in the last talk in particular. Uh, I'm based in Yorkshire and Humber uh, and Leeds is, is in Yorkshire and Humber, which is where Jen's from. Uh, so I'm going to put some slides up now that are very, uh, very brief run through uh, of the HSNs, but also just a few little uh, pointers on uh, remote monitoring that hopefully will be useful if you haven't seen them before. So I'll just try and bring these up. Can you see that? That's working. OK, so. So the HSN uh, is uh, is a network uh, covering the whole of England. Uh, we're not in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but we do have strong contacts into that space as well. So I think Mohin talked a little bit about some interactions he's had with the HSN uh, on his journey. I think he mentioned uh, West Midlands uh, and he also mentioned Kent, Surrey and Sussex on the south coast. So we cover the whole of England uh, and our task or our job uh, is, is really directed by NHS England uh, and interestingly the Office of Life Sciences in government. So they want us to find health tech innovation and push it into practice at scale in the NHS so that patients all across England uh, benefit from uh, new technology. Uh, and, and the Office of Life Sciences are very keen that we do that by supporting businesses like yours uh, and build economic growth in the UK and build jobs in the UK uh, and uh, just generally improve the health outcomes in the UK by dealing with patients who are ill, but also by creating high value jobs, which are great markers of health uh, in the UK. So we've got full coverage of uh, the whole of the UK. There's about 700 of us covering the, the UK. There's about 60 odd million, uh, 65 million people in the UK. So w there's not tons of us, but and we've been around for about eight years. Uh, and really what we've been trying to do is, is drive that adoption uh, and transformation of, of uh, the NHS at the same time. So it's not just about chucking technology at the NHS. It's about working with innovators, a bit like Mohin said, to, to work out what the value proposition is, how we implement a new technology and really uh, understanding if we put a new technology in, what that does uh, to the whole system uh, and supporting organisations to, to get that that bit, that pitch right. Uh, and really, as I said, it's about, you know, improving lives, uh, saving the NHS money and driving economic growth. And Moeing's point was really pertinent. Uh, if you're not saving the NHS some money, uh, you're really going to be in a very difficult position and actually getting that initial proof uh, no matter what your project uh, our project is, uh, our product is, is really important. And we're here to help you have some of those conversations. Now, we do other stuff as well as working with industry. We do a lot of system transformation work. We do pathway transformation work. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of work over the years on AF and cardiovascular disease. We drive uh, some of the uh, work around the patient safety collaborative, uh, which is all about uh, safety in medicines and how medicines are used. Uh, and we are the link for the Accelerated Access Collaborative in the UK. Uh, and, and there are quite a lot of acronyms uh, in the UK. And again, part of our role in the NHS is to simply help you understand what those acronyms mean to you uh, as a business on your journey. Just on remote monitoring, just wanted to, I just pulled these uh, these graphs up this morning, really, to just to let you know what's been happening over the last sort of 12, 18 months in the UK uh, in terms of how remote monitoring is being used in the NHS. Now, this top graph is primary care. That's when you turn up in general practice. So it's not hospital care, uh, but it's where your first point of call is really. If you're ill in the UK, you go to primary care. Most of the NHS's work is done in primary care. And you can see from March, April last year, 2020, a massive transformation has occurred in how patients have been dealt with uh, in this time. And to be fair at this time, uh, actual patient consultations initially dropped massively. You see in April and June, there was a massive drop in, you know, I think about 5 million six million number of patients turning up in primary care, but that's gradually come back to pretty much where it was. But you will see the red bar at the bottom in particular. Uh, telephone triage is now taking up a massive chunk of those face to face consultations. Nearly 10 million face-to-face uh, -face consultations in October last year were done on telephone. Interestingly, uh, video conferencing uh, didn't really uh, hasn't really taken off in the same way in primary care. 
Now, if you look at some of the data, it's 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 doubled or tripled, but it's gone from a really low base of about 0.2% to about 0.6 or 7%. So predominantly, it's telephone triage that is where it's happening in primary care. That's where the innovation has been. The video and online consultation is available, but it is intended to be used that much. And there's something about the patients in primary care that we need to think about uh, to get uh, and uh, to drive an uptake in, in video conferencing in primary care. We need to be very aware of. So there's a lot of talk in the minute about uh, in the UK about digital poverty and the digital divide, uh, and and perhaps some of these primary care patients using a phone is okay and acceptable, but maybe they're not quite set up for full on video conferencing. And and certainly uh, in the first six months of the pandemic, we did have a lot of pushback from patients who who maybe didn't have Wi-Fi at home and maybe were using their uh, their data allowance on their phone to do some of this stuff. Uh, and, and that and that, uh, that can sap up your, uh, your your money and your data allowance very, very quickly. So telephone uh, triage definitely predominantly in, in primary care. Now in hospitals and, a, uh, and in acute care, there, there has been a, a much more uh, nuanced switch away from face to face to telephone and video triage. So there's a little bit more of appetite for that there as well. So you can see in that bottom graph that uh, there's been, again, that initial drop off completely, moving back towards normal, but a big switch away from, uh, you know, if you look at Feb December 2019, February 2020, hardly any phone or, 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 uh, or video triage follow up. That, that's gone up, you know, massively. Uh, lots of work still to be done there, but there's a real opportunity, a real, a real movement there as well. And I think the next generation of video uh, uh, monitoring, conferencing uh, technology and health tech will take a step forward in this space as well, because a lot of the technologies that have gone into the NHS over the last year have act are actually five or 10 years old. They've been around for ages uh, and they haven't been driving loads and loads of revenue into, their, into themselves as businesses because they haven't had much of the market. So they haven't evolved massively. But I think we're going to see over the next 12, 12 months, two years, uh, a massive uh, increase in the capability of video conferencing, particularly around secondary and acute care. So there's definitely definitely uh, an opportunity in that market at the moment. I very briefly just wanted to throw these up. We talked about quite a few of them uh, uh, when Moeen was talking. Uh, here are some of the web links that you definitely do need to be aware of, and we can share these slides with you all afterwards. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's links there to the uh, Spark DPS that Moeen talked about. There's a link there to the wider HSN network. There's a digital technology assessment criteria from NHSX. There's the how to evaluate digital health products. So if you get your product in somewhere in the NHS, evaluate it. Uh, don't just do a pilot. Uh, evaluate it when it goes in and do it properly and follow the advice that's out there. So these links are all out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're coming into this market, have a look through them. Uh, what I would say is link into an HSN. So uh, second from the bottom is the HSN network uh, website. So find an HSN to work with uh, and uh, <clears throat> work with them to understand your challenges in the market, uh, what your value proposition should look, look like and how to engage with the NHS in particular. Uh, in Yorkshire and Humber, that's the way into our HSN. We are one of 15, uh, you know, and uh, <clears throat> You know, we've all got uh, capacity issues. We've all got uh, particular needs in our systems at the moment. So engage with the network, network more widely, but find a network to work with. Excuse me, uh, and and do that work. Uh, that's that's all I that's all I wanted to put on my slide. So I'll I'll stop there, uh, and uh, try and stop sharing. Thanks, Neville. Hope that was useful. Do we want to just have a bit of an open? discussion and take any questions that people might have. Happy to. I'm going to just open up the floor. Uh, this is Moin here. Perhaps I could add one thing of uh, what I found about with the AHSN is that is that uh, they're quite busy, like Neville was saying. So so really think about like the question before you contact that it's like really focused because a lot of the people in AHSN might be actually involved in rolling out things at the moment and and they, there's also practicing clinicians in AHSN so they so I think it's the same if you're dealing with clinicians in, in and healthcare people in your in your home country but you need to be like you know mindful that you know you, you your question is like very clear and to the point and and specific that uh, if you want the reply uh, I think it needs to be in that way otherwise it's it doesn't help. <laughs> it, it won't get through. I, I think I think you make a good point, Moeen, and, and and you're right. I mean, 
<clears throat> the health system at the minute is under extreme pressure in the UK. Uh, and, uh, you know, how how we engage with that is a real challenge. Uh, and uh, getting your value prop, getting your ask really clear is really, really important. And, uh, you know, there's a lot. I mean, if I think about my HSN and where we where we are in Yorkshire and the needs of my region and the health service needs that I'm faced with on a daily basis, the ideal scenario is Moeen emails me the day before the system asks me for a, a particular, uh, they're having a particular struggle in a particular area that he has a particular solution from. Now, that doesn't happen every day, unfortunately. And, and so there is a process of engagement that you need to go through. And, and Moeen, maybe, maybe it'd be useful for you to talk a little bit more. How did you build your network in the UK? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a slog, you know, but it's really important, I think. And I think the more contacts you have, the more lucky yeah. you'll be. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, there's 15 AHSN, so <laughs> uh, contact as many as you can. Uh, I, I didn't contact all, I would, <laughs> um, but I, I think it was. There, there's also some information about which AHSNs are interested in which areas. Um, I think I think all are somewhat involved in patient safety, but then there are some which are more in like pediatrics, some in uh, in uh, uh, elderly care, and there's some in. Um, uh, yeah, medical imaging, um, so, and some might be more in AI. Uh, um, I, I think they need to. Yeah, it's worth to, if interested, to to just go through some of the their websites and see what they have been 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 looking at, and and yeah, just. I, I have to say, I made a mistake when contacting that our value, our value proposition wasn't very well thought through. It was it was it was very vague. Um, so it wasn't. Uh, so the first uh, discussions were difficult because it was just too vague. Um, yeah. and so, so by uh, by not being vague, you, I think you get a better. Um, you save time as well, and you kind of. But I, I think you need to have that sort of way of thinking about the value proposition as well in the beginning, and that that was something we didn't have before we started. Yeah, it's a it's a complex environment here for value proposition. You really got to think about your payer. So who's yeah. paying for the product? Who's going to use it? Because these can be two different organizations. Right. Uh, and you've got to think about the patient benefit as well and the system benefit as well. So the three P's are payer, provider and patient. Uh, and they've all got slightly different uh, needs, haven't they? So the payer wants to save money. The provider wants to make patients better and the patient wants it to work for them, irrespective of everything else. So really thinking about how you articulate uh, your value proposition with those three P's is quite it's quite a useful thing to keep in mind as well. And, uh, you know, you've got to keep engaging across the network. So NHSX run engagement events, the HSNs run a series of events. Uh, I'd really encourage you to, to get to them. It was, it was kind of easier when it was face to face in some respects, because mm -hmm. you could have those conversations in between events over coffee and things like that. But you know, I think that that will come back on as time goes forward. But uh, you know, I, you you really got to get out there and do some networking uh, and make contact and uh, find the right people to work with. Absolutely. Is there any questions? Some nice hand Yeah, there. Jana. I think you've got your uh, hand up. Thank, thank you, Jennifer, and and uh, thank you, Neville. Hello, uh, and and thank you, Moyen, for excellent presentation earlier. I think you put it very very nicely and clearly. There, you need to do homework, and uh, and you and what you said earlier uh, on this discussion that you have to have a clear question. But obviously, you can't have yeah, you can't have clear question unless you do homework. Uh, my my question to you was actually I wanted to ask how. Uh, getting in front of uh, clinicians, like uh, Neville said, during these times it's a bit hard to do networking. But how? What would you be your tip to to reach out to clinicians? And and uh, I mean, obviously after after you've done all your homework. Thank you. Um, I'm, I don't know if uh, it's good to necessarily contact them directly. Um, um, except going through the AHSN, I, I, I mean, if you, if if there is some research, what you what's been interesting for you, like you've seen a paper that's interesting, I think that could be one. Um, yeah, and, and the authors are clinicians. I think it can it can be another good way to contact. But uh, um, 
Yeah, I, I had to be a bit mindful because we have been discussing about its clinical investigations uh, since last year, but then, but then when the COVID second wave hit, then of course you know it didn't. It, it wouldn't be right to 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 push further during that time. So so we kind of okay, let's let's not let's let's just pause for now and and pick up again pick up again when the time is right because uh, it's just wouldn't have been appropriate. Um, but uh, I think it's. Yeah, <laughs> but 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 yeah, yeah. I think that there are probably clinicians who are willing to be contacted directly, but uh, but um, yeah, I'm, yeah, need to be somewhat careful. I think. <laughs> thank you, Moyen. I would totally uh, agree with that. But uh, nice to hear from you know your experience. Thank you. I think I it's the also... same in it's the same in Finland as well. <laughs> I would also suggest reaching out to the DIT and the local enterprise partnership teams as well, because we can help you to identify which parts of the system you might need to speak to. So we work closely with the AHSNs all the time and can help to identify the right person within that team once you've got the value proposition or if you want to get specific feedback on your value proposition. We can also know the local trusts as do the AHSN, so quite often we partner together and go into a trust together. Um, and in Leeds, we've formed like little working groups around specific unmet needs where um, Neville's colleague, Neil, quite often works with me and, and a gentleman called Chris at the Teaching Trust to explore with companies how best to target certain clinicians. Uh, and that's been working quite well for a couple of the um, Nordic companies recently. Um, so I think definitely bring bring on board people that have got a wider network as well and can and can help you to identify who to bring in at what point. Is there any more questions? I can hear the chat box pinging. There's a question from... There's a couple coming. Um, so I've got Craig that said I can't overstate the value of DIT in our recent entry to the UK and also our move from growing internationally from the UK and then Matthew's put everyone says clinical trials and generating evidence is key to getting into the NHS is this the best is the best way to do this through a pilot or can AHSNs help with landing a pilot uh, Neville do you want to answer that one so yeah so Matthew that's a really really good question I mean I think Generating evidence in the UK is the key for the UK market. So I guess uh, the, what you don't want to do is be doing a pilot in, in 15 different HSN, uh, oh, sorry, a, NHS trusts. You want to do your pilot once, do it well, uh, and build an evidence base out of that that helps you to scale. So HSNs can help with landing a pilot, but that's not quite the same as uh, introducing you to a clinician and saying, crack on. Uh, it's a, It's a little bit more about matching needs to the innovations that are out there as well. So what we do in our region and other HSNs do, we, we, we listen to the region. So we sit at ICS and uh, Integrated Care System and CCG, who are the payers, we sit at those tables uh, uh, alongside clinicians and try and understand what pertinent need is in our particular region at this point in time. Uh, and then what we what we try and do is work with the system to create uh, an engagement event around remote monitoring or AI or AR VR was the one we did uh, most recently, uh, where we invite uh, innovators like yourselves to those meetings to present, and we bring the NHS to those meetings to articulate their problem and their challenge. And then in that environment, it's much easier to uh, it, see partnerships form naturally. Uh, I think uh, that that's kind of the approach that we want to try and approach. And then we want to catalyze those introductions. Uh, so if you do uh, come to those meetings and you're interacting with the NHS around a really pertinent need in the system that is now, uh, then there's an opportunity for the HSNs to help you bring together uh, the bits and pieces that are required to deliver that pilot. And I think that's where we see our role. So it's not, it's not a dating agency that we run. Uh, because that doesn't work uh, and Moeen uh, is, is quite right it, just emailing people in the NHS about some great technology you have is is not likely to lead to success you need to build relationships you build relationships over time ideally you do that through uh, talking about uh, challenges on the NHS side that you can help with and I think that's where the HSNs have a role is 
is bringing you into those conversations and allowing uh, good partnerships to evolve naturally, but to evolve a bit more uh, in a bit more of a structured environment. And then we're very interested in supporting those pilots and, and helping you generate that evidence that can be useful. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. So no, it's not a dating agency, but yes, it is about uh, matching need in the system to innovators who are out there. Is there any more questions? Not enough coffee this morning. <laughs> I think um, one of the sort of other things going on in the region is um, that helps you to become aware of challenges um, is groups such as um, Grow MedTech and the Propel um, solution that's run by um, so maybe Neville can talk a bit about Repel perhaps, but the um, the grown um, med tech network quite often runs something called AIM days where they take um, key, clin key clinical challenges or questions um, and try to find a solution with academic and industry partners um, in, a, in a sort of quick sprint type environment. Um, that can be another way of of building your network and engaging with some of the challenges that are currently being faced. Um, and then um, there's there's bigger longer term schemes then like um, like the Propel Accelerator that helps take um, a company through a particular pathway in order to access um, the NHS and starts to look at funding and all sorts of other, um, I'm not doing it justice never. <laughs> Uh, no, you're right. I mean, I think uh, uh, so. There's a question just come in from Asif about interoperability, uh, which is indeed a notoriously complex area, uh, given these systems that are there. So, so I, I'm going to link that question, Asif, to the, the digital accelerator program that we run in Yorkshire and Humber, based in Leeds. So that's a that's a program for companies that are just beyond startup, perhaps not in the market yet in the UK. Uh, and, and one of the things within that program where we offer guidance and a math, couple of master classes on is interoperability, uh, because you're right, it's a difficult area. And I think, you know, Mohin talked on, touched on it uh, in his talk, the ability to talk about uh, working to fire and having the right APIs in place so that you are interoperability prepared, even if you're not doing it now is really important. But the program that we support is, is, is much broader than that. So it's about building digital safety in by design. So that's clinical safety as well as information governance safety. So thinking about these things really, really early as you come into the market in the NHS. So how, how are you ticking all the right boxes that you will need to tick? Uh, and are you aware of these boxes uh, early on is actually one of the things that we like to do. And 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 also one of the things we're particularly clean on, uh, keen on is the idea that we will address uh, inclusivity in your design of your digital product as well. So we're very very keen. If you bring in a product to this uh, market, you're not going to be driving health inequalities uh, uh, further apart. You're going to be tackling that challenge so that you're not going to be bringing a product in that that, that uh, inadvertently increases health inequalities because only certain people can use it. You can't. You can only use this if you've got a top of the range iPhone. Uh, it, it isn't a place that you necessarily want to be. So I think. There is plenty of advice out there to how to deal with some of those interoperability issues. We're lucky in our region in Yorkshire and Humber, we have an integrated care record covering 5.8 million people. Uh, that's not a single uh, product. That's a system of interoperability uh, where there are clear instructions about how you connect into that information highway, uh, the standards you need to adhere to, et cetera. And that's laid out in our digital charter for Yorkshire and Humber as well. So some regions are more advanced in that area than others, if, if, it's, if that's what one of your driving uh, needs are. Uh, and again, the network can help plug you into the right places uh, to, to try and navigate some of those challenges. But for some of our companies and our accelerator program, that's a really good place to start. Uh, and that, that program will be open up again probably uh, June, July this year for Cohort three. Um, um, three. Joseph's got his hand up. Yeah, um, it's Joe Spencer here from the Liverpool City region. 
Um, yeah, we found this that working with uh, various partners, you can um, um, ease your pathway into the NHS. The NHS is a very difficult organisation to work with, extremely difficult. One thing we found is uh, is uh, do something and show it as an example. So in terms of our 5G network, it's the largest in Europe. We've got case studies uh, as part of that, but it's important that you define what the benefits are at the end of that. It's not the benefits in terms of the financial aspect, which is important for the NHS, but it's the benefits of health and social care if you're mm. looking at that as well. So it, 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 it's quite important that when you approach people is, is go in through the right pathway. Otherwise, you can end up going around loops and loops and loops and then come out without any success. It's a good point. Good point, Joe, as well. Thanks for that as well. And that, that point about case studies as well is really interesting as well. So, I mean, I hate using the term pilot. Uh, you know, I, I sort of it makes me itchy because it almost suggests that you're you're giving something away for free. Uh, and it, it's not really about that. It's about really understanding how to implement a new technology, measuring the benefits in a coherent way and turning that into a value proposition that that will sit well in front of the right people uh, if you can find them, Joe. But also having that converted into a case study that's uh, you know easy to read is also really a really interesting approach as well and that becomes part of your comms and marketing plan as well so that's a really good point thanks yeah so i'll just follow up on that if i can neville um in the first phase of the 5g rollout we had in liverpool it we, we weren't doing it to to do develop 5g we were doing it because there was the health and social care problem and 5g was just the excuse to, to do that um but um, I think it's you know out of the first phase we had um, we had, I think we had six companies and three of those have gone on to market their products successfully um, because we were able to define the benefits not only to the medical fraternity but also to people living at home. Mrs yeah. Jones, who's 80 years of age, doesn't have a mobile phone. Press a button, Mrs Jones, and you're connected to your pharmacist, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and so on. And uh, also um, about um, social care workers turning up, they could turn up at any time. And the guy said, look, can you imagine staying in your house 24-7, 365 days away a year, waiting for someone to turn up and you don't know what time they're going to turn up. So your house becomes a prison. Yeah. And, and then we introduced a service to them and they were told within half an hour when the carer was going to turn up. And they said, great, revolutionise my life. Yeah. I think you're right, Joe. That goes back to my three Ps, on, uh, and that really deals with the the patient side of the three Ps, doesn't it? So you've got to be able to talk to all, everybody in the system appropriately about what's in it for them, uh, because there has to be something in it for everybody to get that sale. Uh, it, you know, sales are the same everywhere, aren't they? But thinking payers, providers, uh, and patients uh, is is a good thing to take away from you. <laughs> but, but, but well, my view is they're the stakeholders, yeah, and their opinion is equally as valuable. But valuable and, and actually they can help design your product <laughs> if you think yeah. about it and, and we've done we've done a couple of focus groups around services and we've we've got people in from the community and the ideas that came out of that are absolutely brilliant because they're now part of the solution fantastic john i know you guys have got a really good reputation in the northwest yeah. coast for doing that as well low though i am to recommend uh, other parts of the UK that's not Yorkshire. Uh, I think it's it's clear that you've, you've done some fantastic work over there as well. So I think those are all really, really good points. We've got another question that's just come in. Um, Neville, do you see even more opportunities for remote monitoring now that ICS is will get legal back in? Thanks, Jana. Nice to have a good tricky political question to try and answer. <laughs> That's uh, probably so, your final one too. Yeah. Um, so so I, I think there will be, Jana, I think ICSs will have uh, legal authority. At the moment, they're not legal entities, but they will be probably within the next 12 months. Uh, and I think they will look to commission remote services, uh, remote monitoring services in a way that serves the needs of their populations. Now, at the moment, uh, most of the stuff that's been adopted over the past year has been paid for centrally. So it's been thrown at the system and the centre has paid for a lot of it. So those graphs I've showed you of the innovations that went into primary and secondary care, they're mostly been paid initially straight out of central government's pocket. But that paying uh, problem will sit back with the ICSs, probably not this year, uh, but certainly in 12 months from now. 
So next April, start of the next financial year in 2022, that will be, I think, 22, 23. There'll be a real opportunity for providers in that space because I think the market will be hopefully wide open by that stage. Uh, there'll have been enough time in the system for people to get their products uh, fine-tuned and polished up as well. So, so I think ICSs will be looking for value. They'll be looking to understand the benefit to their patients, uh, the benefits to the system, the benefits to them as the payer, uh, and, and also the particular needs and flavours uh, of their particular places and regions will also be really relevant as well. So thinking about what your different offers are within that space when in, within a particular ICS region will be really important. So, yes, I think ICS is one of a massive uh, bit to play in that space, Yana, as well. And because there's going to be so many of them, <clears throat> we're going to have to have interoperability on the agenda as well, because there won't be one one uh, supplier. There's already 20 suppliers in that Spark framework, I think. So yeah. interoperability is really going to be key. Thank you. Um, does anybody have anything else? Otherwise, I'm going to wrap us up because we're approaching 11 and I'm sure that um, people have got lots of other things to do today. Um, if anybody does want to get in contact with us, I'll make sure that we share our contact details and the presentations for you. Um, I can't see any more hands up. Um, so. Thank you very much, Neville. Thank you, Joseph. And uh, I look forward to speaking to some of you soon as you start to explore the UK. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.